that. <laughs> I, I have started the recording. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Chaos Community Diversity and Inclusion, or no, wait, DEI work group meeting. So let's. Yeah. Are let's we officially get changing the name? Yeah, we have. Oh. Officially, the, like, you know. Is the repo name? Repo name's not changed yet, though. So I've been going through and changing kind of things that I can change that don't have significant cascading <laughs> effects you know so like the repo any urls won't change kind of like how evolution is still growth maturity and decline right right you know a lot of those urls are still in that, in oh, that space i think actually we changed evolution it is there, were, evol there was it, there was it is one, wg evolution now okay there was one i had seen that was still anyway I don't think we're changing. We're not adding the E part for the URL. So please add yourself. You are right, it is evolution. So I was, I had to kind of hastily put together an agenda. I was actually thinking and I'd like to bring this up in all working groups that we have a facilitator that like facilitates like four meetings in a row or something like that. Consistency? Yeah, sometimes I think the rotating facilitator ends up being that nobody facilitates is how it turns out. Or like we forget to assign a facilitator for the next week. And then as a result, <laughs> we end up with no facilitator. So I don't know what people's thoughts are on this, not just for this working group, but for all. I, I okay. think that's, I mean, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, some of the, some of the work, like, I think, I don't know, some of the working groups that I'm in, like evolution and risk, there's a lot of coordination work on a lot of moving parts. And so I've just kind of maintained the facilitator role in those groups which i think is i think that's helpful yeah i mean i i had carter had done it for a while for last year but uh he graduated and starting a new job is a lot of work and stress so right i kind of like the dni badging how they do it um they do mm -hmm. rotate but it's like the very first thing that that we talk about is like who's who's facilitating next week like it's the first item on the agenda and so right. like i think just maybe adding it top of mind, if that's something that we want to do. Um, but in that group, it, it, it's, you know, Matt can talk about it, obviously, but it seems to be like kind of a core group that always comes. I'd, my only concern with assigning someone for four weeks in a row is like stuff comes up and someone might not be able to be there for four sure. weeks in a row. Yeah. So just a thought. I mean, we have trouble getting people to commit to the facilitator role sometimes. And I feel like that's going to be even harder if we try to get them to commit to four weeks. I guess I'm trying to balance too, like, uh, it is, it's the Sean's one comment, like the, uh, some sort of consistency. Like there are, there are times when I'm like show up in a working group and it's like, there's no agenda set or I don't know. It's not all the time. It just happens every now and then. So I was just thinking about this on my run. And maybe if we just commit to doing a facilitator in every working group every week, that would, to your point, Elizabeth, that would be cool. That would solve it. So maybe let's go that route. Who wants to facilitate next week? <laughs> um, I can. All right, Sean Goggins. And I'll get rid of that facilitator comments. All right. Um, so in my hastily put together agenda. Uh, so yesterday we had a, a few badging applications, <laughs> meaning like, I don't know, 10, 8, something 11. like that. Oh, oh, 11. I went the wrong direction. So we had 11 badging applications that all stemmed from, I think, KubeCon, right? They're all kind of in that. Yeah, space. it was that in the co-located events. Mm. Um, so 
Uh, do you feel like you have the the appropriate number of reviewers to work through the 11? I reached out to a bunch of people yesterday. Uh, okay. I sent an email and CC'd you with a bunch of people and I also reached out to other people one on one. And okay. uh, I got three people of interest, uh, people who are interested, and that's pretty different. <laughs> and um, I, and I, I'm reaching out to them. I sent them out a thing to schedule a review orientation. I think it's still important to have an orientation to make sure that we're all in the same place with the reviewing. Um, but once, that, once they're in place, um, I think we would only be maybe one or two more. I have a couple of friends in the in the space who are also reaching out to their friends. So okay, and so you think that that would help? <clears throat> excuse me, would help with like one review or potentially two reviews per reviewer? Yeah, two reviews per reviewer is what I'm asking like from people right now. But like, I'm not asking for any more than two because okay. I don't want to burn anybody out on any on any level. Okay. All right. Um, I did have a couple of comments on this too. So that's great. And then one of the things that I do that I don't know how we kind of keep, keep our eyes on this, but one of my concerns is that from the 11 applications that came in, they came from one person on all of these events. And as the 11 reviews occur, there's going to be feedback that's asked for. So for example, I asked for feedback on like speaker and attendee demographic stuff. So like in my event, it's actually not a call for paper. So I asked questions about, remember last week when he said, how do you um, support diversity in the committee that makes selections on reaching out to keynotes, right? So how do you attend to that? Um, so I had like four comments and I saw that like Dhruv also had maybe two or three comments and like 11 quickly becomes like 40 comments that this person needs to respond to. And so how do we ensure that that can also make it through? Well, the, the first thing to mention is that I, I talked to the person in the comment on one of the issues as well, and um, they acknowledge that it's going to be slow and that it's going to take a while uh, for, for on both sides, I think. Um, but other than that, is there anything we can, there's nothing we can really do for them. I think it's on their side if they have one person reviewing all of it. Do other people have thoughts? on this? It might have been helpful if they submitted maybe one or two um, just to see how the process went and then the feedback that you know we give to them because they're going to have to go back and change you know if they have to adjust something they're going to have to adjust it across the board based on the feedback from one event so maybe uh, we could put somewhere that you know if if there if you if you organize a large number of events we we recommend Maybe you submit uh, one as a as a kind of a dry run or like a pilot, and then you know from then on, then they're then they're good. But you know, then there isn't quite so much back and forth on every single event. But just a just a thought. I don't know if people will actually do that or if they just want to do it and be done. So I don't know. Hey. It might be so, worth uh, mentioning that. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I think if they like if they had like so many submissions, they should probably have like a team on their side, right? So um, that we don't know of. So we could like ask if there's a team that it's handling like the 11, not just one person. So we'll just be sure. So if, if it's a team, we could, if it's not a team rather, we could advise, okay, um, you could make this a team so you don't get all the work, all the questions, get to answer so many questions. Then if they do not follow through, we could advise them, they keep pasting, if the questions are similar, you could, you know, do copy paste on the answers, right? But I, I think uh, they should have a team if they were, if they're able to submit like 11, that's like some strength. That's a good suggestion. I put that in the notes and I think maybe Matt, we could like encourage them to, if there are other people on your team that could help facilitate the process on your end, 
Feel yeah, free I to include them. To say, I think it's easier to say 11 can easily become 40. I think it's a really good way to put it. <laughs> and just reach out to them and make sure that they um, have the uh, have the team to handle that, basically. Yeah. So that might, could you, oops, sorry, can I put that on the maybe action I'll, item, Matt? I'll do an action item to reach out to this person. And, okay. Um, and and I'll I'll run it by you a, a couple uh, maybe be one or two of you first <laughs> to make sure I've I've got the right idea. Okay. So like encourage the team of event planners. Yeah. To help respond. And Elizabeth, to your point, I I believe that this is a similar or the same team that the we were getting applications from before with the LF. Um, so I think it might have been that they saw that it was going well for a few of them and decided to throw uh, all of them at the uh, uh, program at once, uh, tests of metal. But uh, I think, um, I don't know, I don't know for sure though, so I can't, I guess, I'm just speculating, I guess. There might be something else um, we want to think about, and that's if if we build relationships with people who organize a large number of events like this, maybe we have like a dedicated team of reviewers that kind of handles that person's events in total. But I'm just thinking like, I imagine that the framework that they've set up for each event would be similar. So if they're getting a gold on one, they're probably getting a gold on all of them. So I wonder if there's a way that we could um, maybe set up something that's a little more scalable, you know, where they just kind of submit their their framework almost or or something like that, or, or they have like, a, like we have, um, you know, one or two people uh, at chaos that knows the framework and knows their events well and has reviewed them in the past and can kind of just not rubber stamp them but you know has a little more context around the event instead of it being like a fresh set of eyes every single time on something that's repeatable yeah i like that even when you were talking i was thinking like like one of the check boxes is i think ruth gave a thumbs up too like is the code of conduct um, accessible and visible on the web, right? And I mean, like, like Matt, you or I or Elizabeth, like, we could easily go through all the applications and just check that box, right? Because it's the same for all of them. So we may not be able to get full coverage that way, Elizabeth. You know what I mean? But like, like, probably like eighty percent of the applications are the same, <laughs> and check one and it can kind of cascade its way all the way through. And really, if the only difference between the events is the content, um, then maybe we just have, you know, that's the piece that we focus on uh, is the content um, accessible and, you know, diversified mm -hmm. in the ways that we had recommended um, and the speakers and that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah. But also, um, to me, that would also then kind of, it's really interesting because like um, when you when you get 11 submissions at one time, it opens up a whole new series of questions, right? When it's just one or two, it, you can just kind of work through it with an individual. Because um, then the other thing that had come to mind is if, if the events, mm. and I, I'm guessing you're right, Elizabeth, the events are really similar from one to two to 11 that if I'm doing a review and asking for something particular with respect to attendee demographics or speaker demographics, you know what I mean? And I'm posting in the issue saying, could you please do A, B, and C? And then say Ruth is doing a review and it's, kind of, it's actually the same content, but what she asks for is different than what I ask for, which is possible mm. then the, the submitter might be like, it's the exact same in both the events. Why is Ruth asking for something on one hand and why is Matt asking for something on the other hand? Like, why is there inconsistency in the reviews? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people and, and maybe that. there's maybe there's a badge that we want to give to um, to like an umbrella um organizer or something that they can use for their events 
I don't know how I feel about that because then they could kind of slip something in, I guess, that isn't up to snuff. But like um, if you have, you know, the, like the LF is running all of these events, for instance. So like we give them a badge, like they just have to go through it once. And then, it, you know, assuming that they're using the same framework and repeating their process, mm-hmm. then we don't, they don't have to keep submitting. Like they're kind of like recognized as like a, a gold organizer. And so like yeah. all of their events would immediately get a gold badge. I don't know how we feel about that. If that's like right. way too much leeway for them to kind of, you know, take it and run with it. But this is just something else to think about. I know other, other people run multiple events, you know, like the IEEE SA Open people, don't they run a, a whole series of events? So it would be kind of the same thing where we just badge them as organizers and we trust that they are uh, following their own procedures every single time with all of their events. It's just a thought. Okay. So um, as someone who comes from a background of cybersecurity, I have learned to trust no one uh, for a long, for an extended period of time. Um, I think we could have something where we could, um, we could say this is built under this code of conduct, for example, is built under the SA Open code of conduct or something like that. But like, I still think there's we, we need to make sure that stuff is there if nothing else. Uh, if they're if they're up to snuff and they uh, they have a good process for getting this down and it looks good, then um, we can we can go quickly through the process and it would be very easy. Uh, something maybe like they don't have to accept the result for it to be badged as long as it looks good or something like that. But I still think we need that peer review to be to exist no matter what. Yeah, I think the peer review is essential to the whole process. Sorry, but I put a comment in the notes. So I think it would, I think in this case, for the time being, kind of given where we're at right now with all these submissions coming in, that it might be worth having Matt or me or Elizabeth or Ruth or whomever, like picking on people who are on the call, to look across the reviews, all 11 reviews, to make sure that the requests are fairly consistent. And I was, does this make sense? Like we would have a spreadsheet that's like um, across the top could be the different events. You know, each column is an event. Yeah. Going down, going down the left side. Side, yeah. Is all of the like badging criteria. And so like for a code of conduct visible, like that's, I'm guessing that would just be like an X across the, the row, right? because all of them have a code of conduct that's visible. Hopefully the spreadsheet that you're imagining in your head is the same one that I'm imagining in my head. And then um, like the, the row for speaker demographics, we could in the cell perhaps put the comments that are coming from the reviewer. You know what I mean? So then we could get a good look at like, for this event, the reviewer asked for these things with respect to demographics. For this event, the reviewer asked for nothing with respect to demographics. See, okay, so Nicole kind of likes that, as long as we're visualizing the same thing. <laughs> it might just help us create some consistency in the reviews. I, I don't know. Other thoughts? Nicole likes it. Other thoughts on that? Yes, it could also tell you, as a reviewer, um, what to maybe some of the things to look for too. Mm-hmm. So here's my um, experience from yesterday <laughs> um, was for Berlin buzzwords. I was, uh, I was looking through because I was going to create a social tile and I sent Elizabeth two two versions um, and in my experience, I'm looking through the repo of the different comments that the two reviewers gave that particular event and going, oh, okay, here's what Matt said. Okay, here's what the other person said. Okay, and I'm going through. And I'm thinking that those comments would be really valuable to me 
as I review, you know, if I'm a reviewer on, on other events, oh, okay, here are some of the things that I might consider in looking at these different events. You know, oh, here's what, you know, oh, that's really a good point that Matt made over here. Are they doing that? Or are they, you know, it, it, it would be that kind of a spreadsheet would be really helpful to me as a reviewer to, to, to kind of signal, oh, you know, not just do they have a code of conduct um, or, you know, what are their speaker demographics, but, oh, okay, here are some of the things that I should be looking for, you know, that, that kind of thing. Great. Matt, did you have a comment too? You're unmuted. Matt Snow, we can wait. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, I am unmuted. I'm sorry. I did not know I was unmuted. Okay. I like that too, Nicole, because having done a number of these reviews, there are certain areas that are, they, they feel fairly straightforward. Again, I'll just stick with code of conduct. Like, is it visible and on the web? Like the answer is just generally yes, right? Um, the two areas that I have a tendency of seeing more comments on or I write more comments on is the treatment of demographics, of speaker demographics and attendee demographics and what we ask people for in that regard. So trying to normalize that a little bit across reviewers would probably be helpful, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that was, and there was even discussion around, you know, when was it listed or, um, you know, that kind of thing, kind of timing mm -hmm. around uh, when you would list things on your event site or, right. you know, those kinds of things. And I found that really helpful, you know, and, and then um, I, I think I've mentioned earlier this week, I kind of feel like I have a get out of jail free card with Duncan going back to school, woohoo, in uh. person. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so I'm, I, so when <clears throat> Matt's request for reviewers came along, okay, you know, I'm going to, and Elizabeth, I'm going to be reaching out to you, to you too. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm you know, want to get, more involved and so Matt's request came came along I'm like okay and I want to learn get have a lot more so here we go right this is this is you know but that spreadsheet was you know and then when I was diving in yesterday to Berlin buzzwords I'm like okay so that the, the spreadsheet you're mentioning would be super helpful you know here are some of the things to consider yeah awesome and congratulations on having more time. <laughs> I, I do. I still feel guilty. Like I, I still feel like, oh my gosh, does that make me a bad mom? <laughs> like the, the Duncan's been shipped off and you're like, yay. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, oh my gosh, but does that make me like this horrible mom? <laughs> Not at all. My son goes back to school next week and I'm thrilled. <laughs> yeah, my dog my <laughs> my daughter, one of my daughters goes back to school next week and I am overjoyed. Oh, good. It's not just me. <laughs> no, we're either, we're either all awful together or. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, yes. I no longer have a 10 year old sitting next to me. <laughs> uh. All right, cool. This is super helpful. Um, Matt. So, okay. So I had, I'm just going to recap this a little bit. So Yay, thank you, Matt, for reaching out to additional reviewers. Sounds like you're doing pretty well, at least in that regard. And thank you for doing the training or the on, like the onboarding for the reviews. Um, so Matt, I think if see the top of page two, the action item for you to reach out to see if there's a team that can help reviews, like maybe you don't need to do that right away. You could kind of wait and see if it feels like the issues are not getting responses or it starts feeling like it might be overwhelming, but you could probably just add something in there to the issue. Is that okay so far, Matt? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I might also create an issue um, in the repository to help guide people who are wondering what to do too, because we've had that also brought up 
Um, when like, when they like get to the people. issues, like it might get overwhelming really quick. Okay, like you're talking about the folks who actually did the application. Not only the application, but the reviewers too. Um, I, I'm going to. I'm, I'm actually planning. I'm. I'm. I'm going to be drafting an email to like send it to all the reviewers, invite them to like a a signal group most likely, and also um, get get trying to get things coordinated with the reviewers so that everybody's on the same page, which is really important here. Okay. Um, and then maybe Matt, you and I could find just a time for the for the spreadsheet. I think maybe the the first goal of the spreadsheet was be to try to ensure consistency across these 11 submissions with maybe a long-term goal of what Nicole was talking about. Like the short-term goal is just trying to create consistency and the long-term goal would be to help educate others as to, to what a review might look like. You know yeah, I, mean? I think that most of the time I've just used the example of going to a previous review and saying this is what it looks like. Having mm -hmm. a more concrete way to do that is great. All right, cool. Does anybody have any other comments on this? Thanks for all the feedback and thoughts. One of the things that occurred to me, <clears throat> I, yeah, just one small one. Um, one of the things that occurred to me as I was going through this and creating this social tile was, you know, and, and maybe we already say this, because um, I didn't go back to the, to the, um, uh, to the reach, well, I'm missing the word, but the reach out um, uh, uh, documentation. Um, but in creating the social tiles for Berlin buzzwords, in getting the gold uh, certificate or the gold badge, um, is that they do get additional um, visibility or advocacy or marketing through the chaos project. Um, you know, whether, whether that's intended or, or not. And that's one of the benefits of getting the, the badge is not only do they get to reflect that, um, you know, they're, they're fostering these healthy DE&I uh, practices, but that uh, by virtue of us uh, putting, you know, um, uh, making this known through uh, social, as an example, that they get additional visibility. Um, do we make that known to them? I mean, that, that could be, you know, as I thought through this, wow, that could be an additional get for them or additional benefit for them. Right, that they just get kind of a broader reach on social. Just for their because, event. Yeah, just because like, I'm guessing with the social tiles, Elizabeth, you put those out on Twitter and then poof, that's a big, a bigger reach. I don't think yeah. we say that, do we, Matt? Yeah. Even, oh, ahead, even personally, because I, I get to like know about these conferences, right? Because I've never heard of them before. So even with um, us, the reviewers, right? I, I got to know about like a couple of um, Linux Foundation conferences personally. So yeah, it's, it's I really agree with Nicole. I'm taking notes. I think it's a good thing to add. Yeah, because that could be really um, attractive to event organizers. So it not only recognizes their DEI work, but also gives them additional visibility just as an event. Yeah. And that's just wearing my marketing marketing hat. Yeah. Through chaos channels as an event. Okay. Matt, do you have a thought as to where that could go, that statement with respect to patching? That's a hard one because we don't really know where people start. Uh, most of the time the question is, where do I start? Um, so, I mean, like, 
I'll have to think about this one for a second and get get back in about like I don't know. Um, I I almost feel like that's a statement we should be making in person or virtually, like when we're talking to the person, if we have that opportunity. But otherwise, it would be something to put on like the front page of the event diversity and inclusion repository. Yeah, exactly. Like something around the description, right? Or um, on the site or somewhere. Yeah. We have a um, motivation to apply section on the badging page. So that might be go under there. Yeah, it's hard because nobody really reads the diversity and inclusion repository. They always start at admit diversity and inclusion because that's where they get linked. Um, but that makes a lot of, we can put it in both places. It, it, we can't really put it in too many places. Yeah, because, you know, in, in, like, for example, the when we talk to the, um, Comcast team, you know, and some of the other uh, teams um, when we reached out to them. The, the emphasis, it seemed to me, was on, um, you know, what, what's it going to take, right? What, what, what are the resources needed? And if we somehow switch that or, or reposition that so that it's here's what's in it for you you know so that that we can somehow focus on the benefit of of doing this and beef that up a little bit more um yeah that's a great idea and i think oh, go ahead elizabeth uh i was just thinking to that point you know, having that more streamlined process of like you apply once and it goes and then maybe we do spot checks on their events or something like that. But that might be something that, you know, to these larger organizations might be really um, uh, what's the word I want, uh, really attractive to them. You know, if they know that they just have to apply like on an organizer level and not like every single event I do, I have to make another, you know what I mean? So just to that point, that might be another uh, reason that we we look at or think about doing like an organizer level type badge, which is a little more intensive and um, strict, but with like periodic spot checks on their events, something. I like that. And I'm thinking too, so I'm gonna, um, so with respect to an organizational application, I mean, honestly, I can tell you the only, the only real link that I follow on the application for an event is the, the web page for the event. Because everything else I should be able to find, they've either described it as specific to the event in the application. So I may scroll back up to read what they wrote. Um, but everything else I should be able to find just on the web page. Like, are the diversity access tickets easy to find? And can you apply for them easily? Like, I don't follow a link that they put. I put go to the web page and try to track it that way. Um, so as an org, you can just basically say, here are the like the 10 events that are associated with the thing that we're doing, like KubeCon. And um, speaker demographics and attending demographics are handled the exact same way in every event. Here's how they're handled. You know, diversity access tickets where they're provided in every event. But so all I really need is the link to each one of those 10 events. Um, okay, that's a good idea. there would clearly be like, have to be thoughts on the process in the repository, like how that would change the workflow for Matt, <laughs> like how, how that cascades out. Okay. I guess the hope is that it would like release some work from, you know, from the team, cause you're just really badging w once almost. And well, I don't know. It might make it easier on the team is kind of also the, the goal, I think. Cool. I agree. This is absolutely amazing. I just love all of these questions that came from the application of 11 events at one time. Yeah. <laughs> like that we didn't see at all <laughs> coming. Yeah, we totally talked about it for like 30 minutes. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, we had like so much productive ideas. <laughs> Yeah, this is fantastic. All right, cool. 
Um, does anybody, I mean, we have nine minutes left. Does anybody have any other comments on this? Matt, do you have expressed concerns at all with what we're talking through? Much less expressed concerns, uh, more more much um, expressed that I just appreciate everybody here and the community that's made this ha made this possible. I'm super excited. I mean, hopefully, like when I saw KubeCon come across the, that's huge, right? I saw KubeCon <laughs> and I started pacing and then I saw 10 more events. So <laughs> that's where I'm at right now. But I mean, that's like, is that not perhaps the largest open source event on the planet at this point? Yeah, pretty you much. Know? Matt, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm late, late. Both Matt's. Um, are you going to assign those out to us reviewers or do we just grab one? How do you want to do that? No, oh, um, I, I had sent in an email just now um, that I have a, we're still in review orientation sessions, even for the ad hoc reviews. Um, just just like a 15 minute session to um, get you acquainted with the process and get you on the same page as all the other reviewers at this point. Um, so I sent you a Calendly link, I think. Um, but um, once we get that orientation session and you join the GitHub team and the rest is history, we'll, we'll assign you to whatever um, event we, like. We, I think we do two maximum, um, but that's where we're at right now. I would probably leave Kubicon to one person and not give them anything else based on the number of pages probably they're going to have to go through. Actually, the, the, that, that's, uh, I'm on the same page there because we, we didn't assign, the two people that were assigned to that did not get assigned to anything else. We actually just moved it to manual assignments so that the bot doesn't uh, do the picking people too much thing. <laughs> All right, I will try to find. Does that help, Amy? Yes, and I've got the Calendly opened up. I just have to go against my atrocious real calendar. And thank you, Amy, for pointing out that it's Kubicon, not Kubicon. Kubecon, which I have been calling it <laughs> for the entire time. Me too. I usually call it Kubecon. <laughs> so Kubecon, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Uh, all right. So honestly, just in the last maybe few minutes here, um, one of the things that has come up, it came up, I don't remember where it came up, but is to standardize readme files across all working groups. There was some pretty inconsistent, uh, there was some pretty high inconsistency with respect to readme files between working groups. So I started with the DNI working group and if you could take a look at that link and I can share my screen as well. Um, so I had actually kind of worked down the readme file. So I, I to, feedback, totally welcome. You can put it in the pull request. You can say it here, it's completely fine. So the first two top level headers that I was proposing was when we meet and how to participate and a link to the agenda in the meeting minutes. Just that's right up, right up in the front. So this is a recommendation that came from the community call yesterday. And so just there they are right there. A section called background, which this can be edited to some degree, but I'm just trying to say, here's the background of what the DE&I work group is about. And so you can take a look at the text there. I then, so I, what I ended up doing is I took out a lot of the text around problem statement, opportunity. This even reflected some of this text from the chaos mission, just in, in the um, spirit of smaller kind of thing. I just, I worked towards only capturing things in the background. I then followed the uh, common, the common working group structure that just moves right into the focus areas. I had gotten rid of work to date because I thought some of that got kind of dated or was fairly obvious. So I just moved right into the focus areas. 
And here we have the focus areas. I then give a link out to the released metrics site. So when do we meet? What's the background? What are our focus areas and what metrics have been released? And then um, contributing, like how to contribute. So I got rid of like related work. Again, you can totally tell me this is not a good idea. One of the things we did in the evolution working group is I'm trying to pay, oh, oh, apparently I'm not pasting the right thing here. Is we just created an issue and then we linked it to the standard template for repository organization that Georg created and used that to guide the structure. And then the, I think that and the things that you're talking about in terms of detail are can work together. Okay. I'm trying to reduce the amount of detail in the README, to be honest with you. Yeah, and, but, and I think each group can do that. Like I, I don't I think we would have to modify the standard document that Georg produced to okay. make that actually work across all the repos because okay. this it's a structure, it's not a guidance on how big the README should be. And then the other, the other thing I was kind of angling mm. towards was like not having the README contain like time specific information. So sometimes the readmes will say we have, we're working on 11 metrics currently. Like that's a highly variable number and it comes and goes, <laughs> right? So I'm trying to reduce even the number of focus areas. Like you can just have a focused area list and people can count by themselves. So I was trying to get rid of those time specific items in the readme as well. Matt, sorry, are you linking also to the metrics on the web page uh -huh. at all? Okay. Yep. I did. So that was, yeah, that was one in there. So like, here's what we're working okay. on kind of in the, and I should probably put a link to the spreadsheet as well. I'm thinking up on top, I didn't do that. So we had the contributing and the minutes. Yeah, that's a good idea. And so then the focus area section only points kind of within within repo. So it points you to the different focus areas within the repo, but then there was a heading next that said, here are the released metrics from this working group. Cool. Does anybody else have comments on, this is maybe just a philosophy, this is like kind of a philosophy as to where the readme's are going at this point, unless about the specifics of them. Do we um, link to the badging repo in that as well? Or mention did, the badging? I, I didn't. So at least at this point. And so I didn't know where, do you see, a, I mean, maybe in the background section, but maybe not. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. We can what start an want? initiative section. Initiatives? Okay. Okay, I jotted that down. Um, the other thing that I was removing was we've in the readmes we've had a list of contributors, like by name. You know, like for a while we were tracking who was contributing, and ah, that got. I'm not sure how accurate the list is. Basically, it feels old and inaccurate. It's accurate, I guess, to the fact that these people contributed, that these folks contributed at some point, but we don't really maintain it. So it ended up just feeling kind of old. And we are starting to track contributors to each metric. So we are tracking contributions at least that way. People have thoughts on that? Sorry, we're at 1050, but I had that question and then one, one more. Removing contributors off the README? Yes. Okay. It seems like it'd be difficult to maintain. It was, it, I think so. Yep. And looking at how they were maintained, they felt like they were getting pretty old. And then the last was, we do have a section called maintainers. And that it is a little like contributors. It gets pretty old pretty quickly. And like I looked at who the maintainers were for DNI, and on the README, I think it says Emma Irwin, 
it says who's wonderful, but you know, um, is working on other things. I think Daniel is squared is a maintainer. Again, wonderful person, but like just in terms of like, so I'm not quite sure how to handle this because maintainership is kind of important, right? Like who has merge rights on the repository. So I, yeah, it's 1051. You can think about that for a week. <laughs> Provide an answer <laughs> later. Just add your name, Matt. You can just <laughs> maintainer of all of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, everybody, thank you so much for the really thoughtful comments on, particularly on the DNI badging. That was really pretty amazing. So, and Matt Snell, thank you so much for all of your work in that regard. I am absolutely thrilled that this has gotten to where it is today and that we have these types of problems, like tracking this amount of work. That's awesome. So. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great whatever today is, Wednesday. Uh, it is Wednesday yeah, yeah. all day long. Uh, all yeah. day, all day. All Happy right. Bye, everybody. Yes. Happy Likewise, Nicole. Everybody. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.